If you're a big enough business, you're gonna have like a spectrum of users that you have to support. And that spectrum is gonna be like how complex or the complexity that they want exposed to them. And then others just want that UI experience. They wanna go in there and self-service. Then on the complete other end, you've got developers that are just figuring out containers and all they really wanna do is work how they've been working for 20 years. And that's why it's important to know who your pockets of users are, figure out where you can get the most bang for your buck up front, get that solution, get that thing solved, see how you can reuse some of that for some of these other persona personas, but then understand that the, your, the spectrum of different expectations of your users that you're probably gonna have to support. Welcome to another edition of Cloud Unfiltered. I have my esteemed guest, Nick Eberts, who I consider a friend and colleague and <laughs> in the industry. Um, so, so welcome, Nick, and welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Um, pumped to be on here. Always good to talk to you, Mike. Um, it's been a while since I've seen your face. I mean, except for the false start a couple of days ago, but it's it's been a while, right? I think the last time was... Um, KubeCon. Yeah. Was it Amsterdam? Yeah. Or yeah, Absolutely. And I, I should mention, uh, you know, you work at this little place called Google. It's probably not well known yet, but I feel like it's going to be big. Yeah, we're in our, like millionth round of funding i think <laughs> um yes i do i do work at google now i'm a, a product manager in on the gke team focusing on fleets and teams so like our tenancy model and our multi-cluster solutions are all um somewhat corralled out of my brain which is scary but true so you know you, you weren't born into google so so what what brought you here like where did you start out and how did you evolve to to eventually be at google it's a place where a lot of people probably want to be yeah oh it's a it's a long journey so let me tell you all like i'll lead with i do not have a, a degree in computer science my career started off uh trying to be a rock star back in 1998 to like 2002 um that didn't work out um and then uh i needed i needed to get out of queens because Sometimes one needs to do these things. I was born and raised in Queens. I ended up in the military. So I was in the Navy for five years. When I was in the Navy, I did like system administration, right? As one does when they're young. Um, got out, did system admin after doing system administration, had a top secret clearance with an SCI. So that got me a decent job when I got out. And so I did a lot of uh, government integration type work for a while, working for companies like Booz Allen and General Dynamics. All at the same time, I was studying geophysics. Nice. Right. Uh, so for about five years, uh, I was putting myself through school while um, working full time. And uh, at the end of that, that five years, it took me for a four year degree because working is, you know, in schooling is a little challenging. Um, I was, you know, ready to go to a PhD program at UC San Diego for geophysics. They have a great program. Um, found out that my, at the time, wife was pregnant. And I was like, hmm. So I can go to San Diego, 35K a year stipend. So immediate pay cut. And like San Diego, double the cost of living. Baby on the way. And then maybe after five years, make 50K. Yeah. And, and, and at that point I completely, I don't want to know if I sold out, but I, I bought in. Um, and I had a concession of jobs, like just moving up the ladder as one does in this industry. Um, and about God, how long has it been? Maybe 11 years ago, I started working for Microsoft as a solution architect. Um, but right before that, I was working for uh, a company called SunGuard. You may be familiar with Absolutely. and we were um, we were moving all of their uh, financial tools that we sold as a service into Amazon because um, there was a compelling business model, right? There were act actuarial tools where um, they probably needed like a thousand vCPUs or a thousand CPUs twice a year. Um, and up until that point, they were paying for us to rack and stack them for the whole year. Um, so we, we ported and rewrote these applications to take advantage of auto scaling, drove the cost down. I still think that's a pretty, that's probably one of their most compelling services still to this day. So went from there um, to Microsoft. I actually had an offer from Amazon. That's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, so um, 
that eventually landed at Google as a CE and then moved into product management. That's where I've wanted to be for a long time. I wanted, I was looking at product management um, at Microsoft when I was there. Um, but at the time, like there wasn't so much working from remote. Um, I live in Atlanta now in Georgia. Um, and I did then too. And there was no opportunity to PM for, um, for Azure remotely at the time. Well, I think a lot of this stuff has changed now, but so, so here I am PM. Um, working on the fleet team on my favorite managed Kubernetes offering that's out there. So, so for the people that don't understand, like what what this means to to my listeners, explain what this aspect of GKE is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, in one word. No, no, no. yeah, in one word. Uh, oof. Um, so, take a, so, I mean, if if you just take a pause for a second and think about how people have been using Kubernetes over the past, how old is it now? Is it a decade? Somewhere close probably. Yeah, I was actually looking for this for this specific, I was like, you know, this is gonna come up. When did I first like work on Kubernetes? And I tracked it all the way back to 0 0.12. <laughs> so I was working on deploying um, Kubernetes on VMs. There was no managed offering on Azure. So all the way back to 0 0.12. Um, <clears throat> But anyway, so like I've been working with customers and on Kubernetes itself for, for a bit of time. And there's this progression of um, like early on, the focus is how do we just run Docker containers, which may not have been the wrong fo focus. Um, and then it's sort of involved into, okay, well, how do we do operations and security and governance at scale on these platforms or on Kubernetes in general? And then over time, it, it, it started... I think people started to become aware or started running into the fact that there's more than one cluster um, likely in an organization, either maybe you have only two, right? Maybe your clusters are, um, you have two clusters, one in each region, so you can do some high availability or some DR, right? But some of the customers I've worked with have thousands, thousands of clusters, um, which is a management problem on its own. So um, at Google, on the GKE team, we're investing in uh, tooling, uh, and features and services that help manage multiple clusters, right? And at Google with GKE, we call that a fleet. So that's that's the um, that's the the feature set that I manage. Um, in addition to uh, another um, sort of section that we call Teams, which is um, like the tenancy section, right? So fleet is the way that we're talking about managing multiple clusters pockets of homogeneous clusters, right? Um, but the fleet generally being heterogeneous, managing them all together. Um, there's a whole bullet point list of, of things that you probably need to manage and consider. And then Teams is, is okay, well, how do I stamp out a tenant um, that's secure, right, across these clusters? Or better put, that decouples the tenancy and the applications that run in it from the clusters so that a cluster just becomes this fungible, um, piece of compute that I add and remove when I need to. You know the old pet cattle analogy. So, so we talked a little bit offline about um, platform engineering. Seems to be the cool buzzword these days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do people have to consider when when they're when they're creating their app and they and they want to do this consistently and they want to do. You know, they want to deploy all of these things in a way. You know, it's it's a complex world now. What what yeah. what are these considerations, and and how how do you think people should should go about handling them? Well, I mean, I think there's enough variance out there, right? Like, there's no one size fits all, as we know. Um, so, like, any you know, I, I have had a life as a consultant, so like the answer is always, well, it depends, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So the platform engineering. Um, Bit, right. It's really like there's there's we're coming around to defining it right now. There's you know there's people who will consider it a, a portal, a UI. I think that's a little narrow. I think it's it is a UX, right? It's an acknowledgement that maybe Kubernetes isn't the best interface for a developer or for a user. Um, and that they want to simplify things. And you know, that's been happening over and over again, right? We we're, we're constantly repeating ourselves. I mean, how many, how many platforms, I mean, there's gotta be at least 40 different platforms that you can run on top of Kubernetes right now. And then all of the passes that existed before that, that are 
rest in peace, dead. <laughs> um, you know, this is a this is a reoccurring theme. Um, and so I think platform engineering is just this this idea that there's there's not one path that we could go by that's going to run a significant um, slice of our applications as an enterprise business, right? Um, Kubernetes is probably the next to lowest common denominator or highest common denominator, right? From VMs, so maybe we can we can use Kubernetes to run eighty percent of our applications, where um, you know Pivotal could only run like at the time, rest in peace, like I said, like ten percent. You know what I mean? Like so, there's there's this idea that that these companies don't want to overinvest in tools that only represent a very slim section. Um, of the applications that they need to support. So any any sort of store-bought paths has to deal with that fact, right? That there's just different types of applications with different requirements that need to be supported in any platform that enterprises are using today. And so like moving forward, then the way I see customers solving this is building their own bespoke platform, um, which is, Generally, in my space, obviously Kubernetes related, they're taking multiple clusters and figuring out the tenancy model and the security model and how to then build the abstraction on top of it that's best for their particular users. And so to me, platform engineering is really about acknowledging that you are building a platform first. Like if you have a bunch of clusters, you've started to build a platform, one. Two, that platform needs to be treated like a product. It is a product, right? So. What do we do in product management? Um, we interview our users, figure out what their requirements are, right? And then you try to bucket them and build towards those different personas, if you will. So I think platform engineering is a lot about identifying who your users are and maybe cluster sorting them, figuring out which ones to go solve for first and acknowledging that they all have probably different requirements. Share as much as you can, but acknowledge that if you want a good experience for an AI ML operator, their interface is going to be a little bit different than someone who's just writing some JavaScript that's getting um, shipped into a container for a front end somewhere, right? Yeah, and and to that point, um, you know, some of the previous guests that I've talked to brought up a point which I, I didn't even think about, but if you pick the wrong tools that are people are religious about their tools. Mm -hmm. So if you pick the wrong tools at a company, you may actually lose developers. You may lose architects. You may lose these people because it's not the ones they prefer and it's not the ones that are that they know how to work with. So so understanding the platform is is really important. Yeah, and understanding what your users want like that's actually one of the biggest challenges. I've worked with several large financial companies back in my CE days at Google and at Microsoft. And, and this is before the buzzword of platform engineering started, but they were building platforms, right? One of the biggest barriers for these central team success, and, and, and honestly, the birth of DevOps was sort of born out of it. But one of the biggest barriers they had was um, incentivizing these teams to use their platform. They were so rigid and locked down that nobody could fit into them, which is generally the problem with PaaS. Like, so you have to be flexible. It has to be a product. And you can't just like build this pie in the sky set of requirements and expect everyone to acquiesce. You have to meet them in the middle to some degree. Like if you're highly regulated, yeah, you have to handle for those regulations, but you also can't um, put up so many guardrails that, you know, I mean, DevOps is really, it kind of was like an acknowledgement that shadow IT is going to happen if we don't push some of this stuff further out to the business units, right? Yeah. And, and to that point, you know, a lot of this governance is great, but you still have people that are like, well, this is taking too long and it's not working the right way. And you know what? I can do it manually. I have the access to do that. And then you get things out of sync. And then, you, you know, so dealing with that is one of the bigger problems, I think, these days. You have to get that fine line of like, access controls and governance and, and all these things put together to figure out like how how can we do this so that people feel like it's streamlined enough that it works for them but also gives them some of that flexibility to to say but what if you know right no that's that's so on point it actually just made me think of the other side of it too it's like if you're a big enough business you're gonna have um you're gonna have like a spectrum of 
users that you have to support. And that spectrum is going to be like how complex or, or the complexity that they want exposed to them. You're likely going to have some, some shops that are just, you know, low level engineering. They want Kubernetes. Just give me a cluster, right? I want to go into some, some, through some UX, just deploy my clusters to the standards of the business and then just get out of my way. Cause we're going to then manage um, we're almost going to have like a mini platform now that we're going to present to our people, right? If you're a big enough company. And then others just want um, want that UI experience. They want to go in there and self-service. Like, yeah, I don't actually want a cluster. I would just like, like in the case of GKE, I would just like a team where we call them team scopes. I would like an aggregation of namespaces um, that are controlled just for me. Um, and I'm, then I'm going to handle all of you know, configuring and setting up um, configuration deployment, like CD or, or whatever it is I need to push into those those namespaces. And then on the complete other end, you've got developers that are just figuring out containers and all they really want to do is um, work how they've been working for 20 years. They want to work in their IDE. Um, they want to compile some Java. They want to commit that code to some repo somewhere and then go home. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so like if you're and that's why it's important to know who your pockets of users are, figure out where you can get the most bang for your buck up front. So like solve for the biggest or maybe not the hardest problems, but, you know, low hanging fruit up front. Get that absolute, get that thing solved. See how you can reuse some of that for some of these other persona, personas. But then understand that, that you're at this spectrum of different um, expectations of your users that you're probably going to have to support. Yeah. So so how does that. When when we're talking about all these things and in uh, all these considerations, how do you think about this stuff when you're when you're thinking about what needs to be in things like teams and fleets and all these these things? Yeah, I think <clears throat> at its core, there's there's a there's a, a list of things that you need to do to build a, a, almost like a tenancy model on top of Kubernetes, which is what I focus on. Again, this is you don't need Kubernetes to build a flat po- platform. But I'm a PM on the GKE team, so I'm very much focused on how to build a platform on Kubernetes. Um, but there's just core things that that you that almost every platform is going to need, right? You have to figure out how to isolate a namespace. Um, you have to figure out how to put up the guardrails and security that meets your requirements from a business perspective, from a governance perspective, and a compliance perspective. Um, a lot of the times, that's you know, like the standard in the space right now is is OPA, Open Policy mm-hmm. Agent, Gatekeeper. Um, there's others too that you can use that are have more friendly uh, coding languages than Rego. Um, thankfully, a lot of people are doing the hard work to build Rego templates, so not all of us have to go in there and become experts on this bespoke uh, DSL. But um, so you have to start like thinking about what it means to make a tenant at its core. Um, and then once you once you start to understand that, you can start to build the abstraction that's right for the users that you're in, that you're serving, right? Um, so I guess on both ends, it's the it's building it's building the guts of the infrastructure on the bottom. So it's that bottoms up approach, and I think that also to some degree, when you're early, like in the early stages of it, happens in parallel to interviewing your users and figuring out what abstractions you're going to build that are going to help them the most. So yeah, yeah, that's a that's a tough thing though, you know. Yeah. Um, and and it, it's becoming more complex because of supply chain security and oh, yeah. all these other things that we didn't even think about in the, in the past. You know, it used to be. I, I, it's funny. I use this this uh, analogy a lot, but it's it's like a horror movie. You used to be protected, and you know, the, the guy's calling. He's he's on the phone, and he's like, you know. Uh, you think you're protected because you're, you have your door locked and there used to be firewalls where, where your doors are, are locked. And mm-hmm. now the guy, now they're like, well, he's already in your house because now you have all the supply chain security to consider. Right. Uh, you know, but um, you know, but, but there's all these extra things. You have to check your code. You have to check your, you know, well, where did it come from? You're, you're, you're consuming an API that's external. You're, uh, you know, you need to regulate who's accessing things. I mean, the, the world is so complex now. There's so much more to consider. Yeah, for sure. And I think on the security side, a lot of those um, those checks and balances that you're putting in probably apply across 
the platform in general. So a lot of yeah. a lot of building the platform is codifying those requirements. And the platform isn't just the infrastructure that's running, obviously. It's it's the whole development lifecycle of how you're getting from um from left writing code or or even like we can't leave out the people that are using platforms and not writing any code, right? There's actually folks out there whose job it is to uh, to download the latest binary from whatever off the shelf software they're using, right? But the point is that it gets packaged into a container and then deployed. Um, so you have to put you have to think about where all those checks need to be. Um, there's a lot of state of the art stuff going on right now, but I mean, there's this notion that we're pushing all of the um, security left, which might be okay like i it, on theory it sounds good but also do you have enough developers to handle that load yeah like, to some degree platform is is shifting that responsibility away from the developers so they could just focus on what's important and then you have to contend with a lot of other buzzwords out there to like shift left which is then putting <laughs> the responsibility back in on them i think that there's some kind of balance right yeah. um and a lot of the balance on the left side is is through um creating secure templates and automated processes that um, may hit on the left, but don't necessarily require a ton of attention from the developer who's on the left. You know, it's funny. I think about it and, and you know, I, I've been around obviously since the days of, you know, server rooms and I remember doing things. Oh, for, man, I, thought, I thought you were like a spring chicken. Yeah. You know, uh, I've been the people at SunGuard bringing people. I was actually at Tom Disco was SunGuard bought, uh, right. bringing people, I was one of the first three people during 9-11, bringing people back online. And, uh, but, but to go back to what I was saying, it's, it's interesting that we have all this convergence in the cloud world now. It kind of reminds me of, uh, uh, not in the cloud, in the cloud native kind of development side of it, or the, or the life cycle side of it. It kind of reminds me of when the cloud providers first came online and, and, you know, you had a network team, you had a server team, you had all these teams, and they were very siloed. Everybody had their specific functions. Mm -hmm. Now the same thing's happening in the lifecycle world where you have, you know, security coming into it. You have, uh, you, you have networking, you have development, you have all these things that are kind of converging again, too. So everything's kind of just smushing, 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 smushing more together and becoming more... Uh, involved and more complex because of that. Yeah, no, for sure. I think um, one of the things that helps a lot of these companies in that to solve that specific problems is Git. Now, I don't know if Git is the long term right um, abstraction or the right interface, but this whole like core, uh, this whole idea of inner source sort of gives you a way to allow those teams to naturally de-silo, become unsiloed, to come together. Um, because you do things like leave, make sure the repo is read only to all the teams, right? You accept PRs. So if I'm on if I'm on the app team and there's a security thing that's breaking me and I know how to fix it, that's in a way that satisfies the that still keeps it secure, I could just issue a PR, right? So like taking down those barriers from who does what work and who can see what from silos to at least like see through glass that you can punch through, I guess, when you need to is super important and Git kind of gives you that, right? Because then like your security team maintains the security standards repo for all of the network policies or whatever you're pushing out to all of your um, platform, but they accept PRs from whoever can, who, you know, can, can actually solve for the problems. And if you're a security team, you should accept those PRs. Like let those other people do your work for you. Like, why not? Don't become the bottleneck. I think that's, I mean, I come back to like, you know, uh, the fact that you still, the developers are still the ones that really started out with like things like Git. And if you have other teams that are, that are, that you want to engage with that, Sometimes that's not the natural thing, you know, and sometimes yeah. it is, but um, I think that's part of the problem that we're seeing these days is that, you know, there are a lot of hard yeah. 
it's 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 more of a political thing. Like, you know, I don't want to do it this way. I've been doing network for 50 years. I'm going to retire in one year and I don't want to. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you've got you've got these ITIL pros who are like certified and they're like, yeah. you must follow this rigid change process. But meanwhile, like statistics and data show that that change process is actually on making your companies less secure and slower and um, losing in the market. You know what I mean? So like there has to be, I think, an acknowledgement that, I mean, while having processes is good, it cannot be what we were doing in the early 2000s with ITIL and that whole change management. Oh, my God. Yeah. I have to admit, I hated ITIL. <laughs> you know, every, nobody, I don't know if anybody likes it other than the people that get certified in it and paid more because they have certifications. But whew. Yeah, that was rough. That was rough. And it's, it's funny, you know, even reading... It, in the early days when you did like network essentials or something like that, you had to learn about token ring and, and stuff that wasn't even something that you used anymore. And that's what I felt like a lot of ITIL was. It was like a lot of theoretical, mm -hmm. <laughs> even CISSP was, was a lot of real theoretical stuff. But, you know, I was a hacker from the early days, you know, and it was like, well, this, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some acknowledgement of like looking at processes. So one of the things that came out of the 80s, which like spurred on this whole DevOps revolution is uh, um, the theory of constraints, right? I'm sure you've heard, right? everyone at this point has probably read, um, uh, what's the book that, uh, that, oh, I'm slipping, Gene Kim's book, his first book. Oh, the Phoenix Project? I actually had Gene yeah. Kim on at one point. <laughs> oh yeah, the Phoenix Project. Like the Phoenix Project is basically like, I don't want to say an exploitation, but like an exp exploration of how the theory of constraints could be applied to, to, to IT and software engineering, right? Often what gets lost is that we focus on the tools, we focus on all the fun tech, but it's based on the theory of constraints. The first thing you need to do is identify what your constraint is. The whole point of that those books, both the old 80s one and Gene Kim's version, is that if you're fixing something that isn't your constraint, you're not actually going to improve flow. So for example, if like, if adding continuous deployment or if, if deploying faster is not actually your, if deploying slow is, is not your bottleneck, adding continuous deployment is not gonna fix anything. Um, and that, I feel like that gets lost a lot. Um, we, you know, we get, as an industry, we're really bad about someone seeing a market opportunity of some interesting philosophy or process and then capitalizing on it with tools <laughs> That they need well, to how many, how many yeah. times I'm sure you've heard it I'm talking to customers it's like well I was told that we need to containerize our applications but why what is what is the what was what was causing you to come to that conclusion and and most of the time you'll hear well my management told me that we need to do this you know and you know a lot of times it might not be the right thing I mean look at that you know Amazon letter that went out there a while ago about how they went back to monolith and for, for some of their, was that Amazon? Yeah. Or Amazon? I forget. Was it? Um, <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah. But, um, talking about. I think that was um, Amazon. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's you, to me, and I've, I have this conversation all the time with other guests is that, you know, I'm, I'm someone who's in emerging tech and I'm paid to look at the new solutions. That's what I do, but it, but it's because it's my job. That doesn't mean that you should always go to this new shiny object. You have to think about, do you need scalability? Do you need multi-zone? Do you need a way to right. deploy that? You know, you have to figure out those requirements first. And a lot of people are just like, well, I heard of this, or I think this is the way, or, but there's no real requirements or thought before that. Yeah, no, that's true. I think, I think a lot of the, the, the forcing function into containers is, there's definitely a value prop to containers. I think we all acknowledge that now. There's also a desire not to have to maintain like completely different in infrastructure, right? And so you could build a really robust system on EC2 or on our, you know, our Google version of um, scale sets um, with VMs. Um, and then you're gonna get to the, like thing one will come up, oh, okay, well, we need health checks. All right, so, so you write health checks. The cloud provider probably has some health checking mechanism with load balancers. And you're like, oh, well, and it needs auto scaling. Okay, so you figure out auto scaling. 
And you're like, oh, but it's got this other thing that it needs to talk to and it needs to discover when the IP changes. So then we got to figure out service discovery, right? And then you're like, oh, okay. And then you know, like, you know what? We really need this thing to restart when it fails or scale out automatically based on load. My point is like, you're going to get to a point where you've almost recreated the Kubernetes API. Yeah. And so I think a lot of these people that are dealing with VMs or these customers that are dealing or users that are dealing with VMs and trying to cram them into containers when it doesn't make sense, it's this idea that even though this isn't a cloud native application, <clears throat> there's a bunch the API gives me um, to make it worth it, even if I'm only running one container on a like one monolith container on a VM. Um, and and the, the benefit of um, running my old stuff de- next to my new stuff is sometimes worth it. Not all the time, but I think that's why, why you see a lot of uh, legacy applications getting crammed into containers because there's some initiative, right? Driven from up high down below is that we need to, we need to be more efficient and collapse and da, 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 da. And basically that's just like executives saying, um, these are my OKRs and I don't get my bonus if we don't <laughs> containerize. So we'd like to do it, but there's, you know, there's a driving force behind it. That's about efficiency, I think. And, and so that's where you end up with, um, square pegs and round holes running on Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so we're getting towards the end here. Is there other things that you're working on that, that you, you wanted to cover here that might be interesting to some of our listening and viewing uh, patrons? <laughs> um, I mean, oh, man, I love, I really do love the things I'm working on and the, the folks I'm working with. Um, we're exploring some interesting things. I'd say the um, like getting nerdy for a second. One of the fun things that one of the fun challenges I'm, you know, we're solving with the team is um, this whole notion of fungible clusters, right? So basically, how can I treat multiple clusters like one logical cluster? Um, so you can, and I'm I'm curious. So I'm throwing this out there almost as I'd, I'd like to hear what you think about it. Like, so my idea is like, hey, you've got this concept of a fleet. It's got n number of clusters in it running, you know, y number of applications. It may be a worthwhile exercise to figure out which of those applications should coexist together on the same clusters. Maybe it's like these two types of apps been packed better together. Maybe it's, oh, they have the same sort of requirements from a security perspective. So we'll put them together like they're PCI compliant or something. But like, then you end up with these subgroups of clusters within a fleet. And those subgroups are mapped to a specific set of applications. So it's almost like you end up with these homogenous pockets of clusters within a group. And then you have many groups within the fleet. Um, And then the idea is, well, how do I, what do I need to make that true, right? And one of the first things, and I'm bringing this up because I know you're a networking nerd. One of the first things that jumps out at you is like, oh, wait, hold on. I need all of the those clusters to be routable east west. I need a load balancer in front of them that just discovers um, the new endpoints when I add another copy of the cluster shape. And so we're doing some really fun things with the gateway API. I'm sure you're you, that that hit your that that nerd sniped you. But yeah, so the gateway API is really API is really interesting. We're able to do a lot more fancy routing. Um, and we've built controllers, like implementations of the gateway API that are multi-cluster. So we have this multi-cluster gateway that just <clears throat> allows you to essentially onboard a cluster. Um, and if it has the right, if it has the applications in it that are part of this multi-cluster gateway, it's just going to automatically become part of the back end. Um, so that's pretty neat. And then from a service discoverability perspective, there's always service mesh. You can multi-cluster mesh. Mm-hmm. But there's also like, oh, wait, we don't want sidecars. We don't really need any of the other fancy stuff. We just want discoverability and routing. Um, so multi-cluster services is kind of addressing that um, space. Have you looked upstream at MCS at all? What is it? Multi-cluster services. I, I have it. Oh, okay, yeah. So um, that's actually the only thing that I've contributed directly to within the org. Um, uh, you know, that's what gets me into the contributor summits and stuff these days, but it's it's a passion project. Like it's the idea that you can um, have service IPs across N number of clusters all cross register 
so that um, like your service can be discoverable and routable across multiple clusters without really cool. doing anything fancy. Yeah, it's it's really neat, man. Um, but it takes down that barrier of these are two different clusters, right? And so I think we're continuing to knock down those barriers and working in um, multi-cluster, SIG, SIG multi-cluster to, to make sure that all the things um, that we're solving for are also getting pushed upstream. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah I'm actually going to take a look at that because that yeah. sounds really interesting, actually. Yeah. I honestly don't get as much time to play around with things as much as I used to. But, uh, you know, when I hear stuff, that's usually when yeah. I go take a look at it, you know. Okay. Hey, hey, um, hey, Cisco, um, <laughs> give this man time to play. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All work and no play makes Mike a dull boy. That's right. I, I actually wish I had more time to play. Um, so, so where can people find out more about you, what you're doing, things like that? Um, um, well, for one, just check out GKE uh, and then take a look at fleets. Um, and maybe I'll give you some links and stuff for show notes or whatever. Um, yeah, that's it. Well, thanks so much for coming on the Cloud on the Filter, and hopefully, we'll see you again soon. Yeah, man, I really appreciate it, Mike.